Hi everyone! Tonight's video is on protein, shape, and function. In order to understand this video, you should have already watched Introduction to Proteins and also Proteins 2, which is the levels of protein structure that determine its function. So how does shape determine function? Well, let's look at this very simple example. We have a spoon and a fork. A fork is a very good tool for eating a salad. It's a very bad tool for eating soup. Why? Well, it's got the wrong shape. The soup is going to fall through the prongs in a fork. A spoon, on the other hand, is a great tool for eating soup. It's a terrible tool for eating a salad. Why? Because it has the wrong shape. It doesn't have anything to kind of poke into the salad to bring it up to your mouth so that you can eat it. So these could be composed of the exact same thing. They could both be plastic. They could both be metal. Their composition isn't what's important to their function. It's their shape. So what about proteins? Well, proteins have to interact with other substances, just like a spoon has to interact with soup. So the other things that proteins have to interact with are other proteins or sugars or lipids, and they have to interact with them in order to perform their function. They have to be able to recognize the correct protein or sugar or lipid to work with. They can't just work with any old one. They're specific. An example here is an antibody. Antibodies are proteins, and it's pictured here in this green kind of Y-shaped molecule. Antibodies recognize pathogens. Pathogens are anything that make us sick by shape. So antibodies are something that our proteins, our bodies produce in order to fight off pathogens, such as viruses and bacteria. Enzymes are also proteins, and they are proteins that make reactions happen. They recognize what they work on by the shape. So this pink and yellow molecule here would be the enzyme, and it has a very specific shape here in what's called its active site. And it's this shape that's going to recognize the molecule that it's going to work on. This molecule would fit exactly into the shape of the enzyme so that the enzyme could make the reaction happen. So proteins work exclusively by shape. When a protein loses its correct shape, it loses its function. Again, here's a great example. Let's look at this fork. It has no ability to pick up a salad. It's now a useless tool for both a salad and soup. A protein that's lost its shape, like how this fork has lost its shape, it's changed and is no longer functional, and the term we use is denatured. We would call a protein that has lost its overall three-dimensional shape a denatured protein, and a denatured protein no longer has the right shape, so it no longer has its correct function. What causes a protein to lose its correct shape? Well, that would be a change in pH, a change in salt concentration, or a change in temperature. How? Well, think about how the three-dimensional shape of a protein is determined. So we need to go back and look at the tertiary shape of a protein and the reactions are the bonds that form this tertiary shape. So we could have hydrophobic interactions where we have two R groups that cluster away from water. We could have hydrogen bonding between two amino acids. We could have disulfide bridges forming between the R groups of amino acids, or we could have ionic bonds forming between these amino acids. If you changed the salt concentration, that means you're going to have, let's say you added a lot more salt to the, to the environment. You'd have a lot of positive and negative charges floating around. That might mean that this positive part of this R group, instead of being attracted to the negative of this R group, might float over to being attracted to one of the ions in solution. The same with the negative could be attracted to a positive ion in solution. That would disrupt this ionic bond. Temperature could also disrupt both an ionic bond and a hydrogen bond because as you increase temperature, you increase kinetic energy. And with increase in kinetic energy, you get an increase in movement. That could disrupt these interactions, these hydrogen and ionic interactions. If you change the pH, that's going to very specifically disrupt disulfide bridges. If you have an increase or a decrease in hydrogen concentration, it's going to make these easier or harder to form because these sulfur groups could go back to forming a sulfhydryl group of the individual R groups. 
pH could, a change in pH, I'm sorry, could also disrupt hydrogen bonds by changing hydrogen concentrations and disrupting these hydrogen bonds. So a really critical point of knowledge here is that de denaturation disrupts the tertiary structure. It doesn't change the primary structure or the secondary structure. It disrupts the tertiary structure. And that tertiary structure is what determines the shape of the protein. Because shape determines function, if a denatured protein loses its three-dimensional shape, it can't function. It loses its function. So you should know, you should understand how shape determines function. And you should understand what level of protein structure determines that shape of a protein. It's the tertiary structure. You should know the meaning of the word denature, and you should know how to spell it. There is no Z in this word. So chemist, our biology teachers are continually frustrated by students writing denaturized. So the word is denature or denatured, and there's no Z in this word. You should know what level of protein structure is impacted by denaturation, and you should know what conditions can cause a protein to denature. Finally, you should be able to explain how specific denaturing conditions affect specific bonds in the tertiary structure. So that's all for tonight.